These are ships of the United States 7th Fleet, ships of many types and characteristics, ships of the most powerful single sea force in the world today. Flanked on the west by communist China and on the east by the friendly island nations of the Western Pacific, the 7th Fleet patrols the Asiatic seas. All is calm, peaceful, but potentially dangerous, like a powder keg. Take the fleet away, and the fuse may light. For the 7th Fleet is the balance of power in the trouble spots of the Far East. Since August 1949, the 7th Fleet has played a major part in preventing the spread of communism in the Far East. With headquarters at Subic Bay in the Philippines, units of the fleet, then at peacetime strength, patrolled the Western Pacific, including the Sea of Japan, the South China Sea, Formosa Strait, and the East China Sea. At that time, there were no carriers under the US flag in that area. This was the setting when, on Sunday, June 25th, 1950, North Korean troops surged across the 38th parallel and the Korean conflict broke out. Immediately, several units of the fleet operating in the China Seas joined units of the British fleet out of Hong Kong and sped to the assistance of the Republic of South Korea. At the same time, President Truman assigned a smaller force to protect Formosa. Made up mostly of destroyers and patrol planes, it was called the Formosa Patrol Force. 250,000 hostile Red Chinese troops and an estimated 5,000 vessels were poised on the China mainland, ready for amphibious assault on Formosa. Meanwhile, to the north, the American and British ships were arriving on the Korean east coast. On the 29th of June, the cruiser Juno became the first ship to conduct shore bombardment under the flag of the United Nations. A few days later, on July 3rd, the USS Valley Forge and the British HMS Triumph launched the first aerial bombardment. There were many more to come. But it took more than naval bombardment to halt the advance of the communist forces in those early days. Troops, equipment, and supplies were needed badly and needed fast. By August 6th, only 42 days after the outbreak of fighting, the North Korean aggressors had pushed the poorly organized United Nations ground forces to within 40 miles of Busan at the southern tip of Korea. Beyond Busan lay the sea. But from the sea came help. Seventh Fleet support ships operating around the clock brought men and materials. The North Korean army slowed and stopped. Throughout the war, the amphibious forces were called upon to deliver goods of war. Sometimes, as at Incheon, the landings were under fire. And sometimes, as at Hungnam, the purpose was not delivery, but evacuation. Late in 1952, UN ground forces were making an heroic stand in the battle for the chosen reservoir. But outnumbered six to one by fresh red Chinese troops, the United Nations forces were ordered to fall back. Fighting deep snow and sub-zero temperatures, they begin their long retreat to the sea. Up the mountains, down the valleys, weary step by weary step. Over 1,500 men wounded and 600 stretcher cases. Overhead, Navy and Marine planes keep the corridor open. Air Force C-82s make airdrops of food and medical supplies. Helicopters and small planes evacuate the critical cases. Finally, Hung Nam and escape to the south. A sea lift by the 7th Fleet, salvaging men and equipment to rejoin the fight to save South Korea. Throughout the war, the planes and ships of the 7th Fleet, operating offshore in the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea, provide continuous assault on enemy strongholds in support of the ground forces. Red-held coastal cities like Wonsan and Chongjin are pulverized by the impact of big naval guns. Minesweepers clear the coasts for the bombardment ships in the face of enemy shore batteries. And fast, active destroyers and LSMRs give the enemy no chance for rest. Carrier-based Sky Raiders, Corsairs, and jets carry the fight inland, hitting bridges, rails, roads. 
Meanwhile, for three solid years, ships of the Seventh Fleet were kept in action by a 7,000-mile supply line from the United States to Korea. Transports, cargo ships, tankers, and ammo ships keep a steady stream of men and materials moving across the Pacific until the job is finished. July 27, 1953. The end comes in a little shack at Panmunjom. The end of three years and one month of bloody fighting. The end of 1,098 days of seesaw struggle. Following the ceasefire in July 1953, the 7th Fleet area of concentration is shifted from Korea to include other points of American interest along the 2,000-mile coastline of Eastern Asia. From Korea and Japan in the north, ships go to the South China Sea between the Philippines and Indochina, the East China Sea near Formosa and Okinawa. A large part of the fleet remained for some time longer in the seas surrounding Japan and Korea. Training exercises and patrol go on to maintain the high standard of readiness required of a force of warships. The presence of the fleet near Korea also serves notice that new aggression will meet swift retaliation. Some units go to ports in Japan and the States for necessary upkeep, including recreation and leave for the crew. For some men, it means transfer to shore duty. Other ships go south to augment the Formosa patrol. In January of 1954, Vice Admiral Alfred M. Pride, commander of the 7th Fleet, meets with Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek and 40 of his top military and political leaders on board the carrier Wasp at Formosa. The shipboard meeting, first of its kind, symbolizes the bond of friendship and military accord which exists between the nationalist Chinese and United States governments. For these American sailors, it is also their first look at the almost legendary Generalissimo, the Chinese leader who for a lifetime has fought an unrelenting battle against Japanese aggression and then communism in Asia. Several months later in August, people of another Asian country take steps to save their freedom. Over a quarter of a million Vietnamese choose to leave their homes in the northern part of their country rather than live under the rule of communism. Transport ships of the 7th Fleet are used to evacuate the refugees to the south as the United States extends a helping hand. The operation is called Passage to Freedom. Then on September 4th, 1954, a new crisis develops in the long struggle between the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists. Communist shore batteries open fire on the little island group close into the China mainland called Kimoi. This act looks to be the first intention to carry out the promise made by Red China to liberate the islands under nationalist control, including Formosa. Nationalist troops dig in on the island outpost as the possibility of amphibious assault appears imminent. Almost immediately, the major units of the 7th Fleet are shifted to Formosa to augment the United States and nationalist patrols in the strait and along the mainland. The action upholds the United States pledge to meet the common danger, communism, when its Western Pacific allies are endangered. The shelling of Kimoi subsides after a time, but the threat and the danger still remain. Early in 1955, the Tachan Islands, situated some 250 miles north of Formosa, and also threatened by large numbers of communist forces on the nearby mainland, are considered to be a detriment rather than an asset in the defense of Formosa. It is decided to evacuate to Formosa the 14,500 inhabitants and the 10,000 nationalist troops stationed there. Once again, the 7th Fleet is called in to effect the evacuation this time aided by nationalist ships and backed up by its own carrier aircraft and guns. From Okinawa, Formosa, the Philippines, and Japan, 132 U.S. ships converge on the Tachens. Sabre jets of the 18th Fighter Bomber Wing are added to the patrol of the sea lanes that lead back to Formosa. Cruisers and destroyers prowl the East China Sea within range of communist air cover and shore batteries, while U.S. carriers fling an umbrella of jets over the scruffy little islands. In addition to the civilians and troops, all supplies and military equipment are moved out. Nothing is left. Nothing. 
what cannot be taken away is destroyed. As the evacuation is completed despite wind and gales, Admiral Pride wires Washington, nothing was left on the Tachins or surrounding islands that is of any use, including tin cans. Today, over 100 ships and 400 aircraft of the 7th Fleet, together with nationalist ships and troops, stand ready to defend Formosa and the Pescadores. On Formosa, Chung's army is U.S. trained and equipped. His Air Force flies U.S. aircraft, and his growing Navy includes many former American ships. Flat tops provide the backbone of the 7th Fleet's power. The advantages of these floating air bases are several. Long-range striking ability, concentrated offensive and defensive power, and ability to strike quickly at coastal defenses, airfields, and production facilities, and then move away fast to look for new targets, to ready for new attacks. But the ships and men of the 7th Fleet represent more than military might in the Far East. They are a symbol of hope and a pledge of friendship to the peoples of free Asia. With its trained fighting force of men, ships, and planes, the 7th Fleet provides a mobile fortress in defense of our Western Pacific allies. It is the mission of the 7th Fleet to safeguard the integrity of these smaller nations, to see that communist expansion along the shores of Asia is stopped. Only the future can bring the answer. Meanwhile, the silent patrol goes on, and the 7th Fleet watches and waits.